Christian died Suffering at the hands of Rome Cause they believed in Christ alone They died through Europe, especially Spain For they saw all but Christ is vain He suffered by his death for men To save them from their awful sin Six hundred years of martyred saints That history cannot erase With iron heel and iron hand The Roman popes rule the land Those ignorant of history May be swept into apostasy We won't be loved by Rome, sweet lie With fifty million reasons why Salvation is by faith alone In Christ alone, by grace alone A sovereign God give faith to man Salvation's in the Maker's hand This gospel offends Rome today they offer up another way, a counterfeit, a compromise. Beware the ancient papal lie with such a cloud of witnesses who by grace died in their Lord. Recall their memory to say, by the same faith we live today. Good evening. Welcome to Walt's Mystery Babylon News Radio. My name's Tom Press, hosting. Tonight, we'll continue our reading and discussion of the book, Romanism and the Reformation. Last time, we concluded on the top of page 151 in the book, the online version of this book from archives.org from the University of Toronto. So, we will retreat back to the last paragraph we read before the conclusion of the program last last time and we'll read that we'll re- reread that for continuity purposes and then I'll remind the listeners one more time we'll have one full hour of reading of the book and then hopefully one full hour of fruitful discussion by the participants Uh, in the final hour. So I'll begin by reading the last full paragraph on page 150. This is point eight of an eight-point comparison between the little horn of Daniel and the Antichrist of John, the Revelator. We are proving that they are one and the same entity. It is the papacy. The Roman Catholic Church is spoken of both by Daniel and by John the Revelator. Again, this is point eight. Speaking of these two uh, descriptions, one given by Daniel and the other given by John, he says, they end in the same manner and at the same time. This completes the evidence of their identity. The persecuting horn is slain by the ancient of days revealed in judgment and the glory of his kingdom. Daniel chapter 7 verses 9 through 11 and verse 22. The persecuting head is slain by the king of kings and the lord of lords revealed in that judgment in which he treads the winepress of the fierceness of the wrath of Almighty God. The judgment is the same. Revelation chapter 19, verses 11 and 20. The little horn and revived head, then, are alike in place, in time, in character, in authority, in persecuting action, in duration, and in doom. They arise at the same point. They last the exact same period of time. They do the same deeds. They come to their end at the same moment and by the same revelation of Christ in the glory of his kingdom. 
They cannot prefigure two powers absolutely alike in all these respects, but one and the same. Even the Church of Rome admits their identity. It teaches that both are symbols of the same great persecuting power. Now, isn't this ironic? The Church of Rome, that very persecuting power spoken of by Daniel and by John and even by Paul, that very persecuting power the Church of Rome admits that they are one and the same. And yet she denies that she is that power. What, what deception? Rome herself admits that these two entities spoken of by Daniel and John are one and the same. And yet she fails to recognize, or at least the vast majority of her followers fail to recognize that it is the Roman Catholic Church itself and the papacy. Now, he continues, he says, the way is now clear to consider the interpretation of this prophecy. It is indeed determined already by this very identification. The little horn of Daniel <clears throat> prefigures, as we have proved before, the papacy of Rome. Let me read it again. The little horn of Daniel prefigures, as we have proved before, the papacy of Rome. So then does this revived head. We will examine briefly the evidences which sustain this conclusion. But as we have already sketched the history, we need not dwell at any length on the different points. We will take the prophetic features in the order in which we have already presented them, considering first the facts related to the rise and then those concerning the reign of the power in question. First, then, as to its rise. The predicted head rises from the Roman Empire. Remember the four beasts of Daniel? Medo-Persia or rather Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and then Rome. We've already concluded that Rome is the fourth and final empire, Gentile empire, to rule upon the earth. Now, what does that have to do? <clears throat> what, what can we automatically know about those who say the Jews rule the world? No, Rome rules the world. What about those who say that, no, Great Britain rules the world, London is the great beast power. And there are many who say this. They are in error. They deny the scriptures. The scripture tells us that Rome will be the fourth and final beast upon the earth. And that Roman power was in existence at the time Jesus walked the streets of Jerusalem. And we know from prophecy, irrefutably, uncontestably that that same Roman Empire that was in power at the time of Christ's crucifixion would rule and reign until Christ returns and destroys it with the brightness of his coming. Has Rome been destroyed? Has Christ returned? No. Then you must admit that Rome still rules. The Jews don't rule. England, the crown, London, does not rule. If it appears that the Jews rule the world, or that London rules the world, or that Washington, D.C. rules the world, it's simply to distract you from the biblical truth. We can rest assured that that Roman Empire is the fourth and final empire upon the earth, that it is reigning today and will reign until Christ returns. So don't let anybody tell you that London rules the world. Don't let anybody tell you that the Jews rule the world. Those are just put up to take the onus away from the Roman Empire. This is Satan trying to cover his tracks. All right. First, then, as to its rise, the predicted head rises from the Roman Empire. 
It is therefore Roman. So is the papacy. We've called the system which owns the Pope as head Romanism because its seat is the seven-hilled city of Rome. Secondly, the predicted persecuting power grows up in the second stage of Roman history. It is the seventh or last head of the old empire revived. Okay, the old pagan Roman empire was simply revived as papal Rome. Okay. First we had the Caesars, and now we have the papal Caesar in the revived Roman empire. He continues now, he says, now this is the exact position of the papacy. The papacy belongs to the second or the Christian stage of the Roman Empire. There are two stages of the Roman Empire. First, the pagan Roman Empire, which Rome boasts as having destroyed. And then there is the papal Roman Empire that is in existence today. He says it grew up among its Gothic horns or kingdoms. It was the revival of a power which had been slain. When the pagan empire was overthrown, the papal rose in its place. First, the Caesars ruled in Rome, then the popes. The Goths overthrew the Roman Empire in the 5th century. Romulus Augustulus in Uh, abdicated the imperial dignity, that is his throne, in 476 A.D. This was the deadly wound of the seventh head, according to the prophecy. From that date, the papacy grew with freedom, grew up among the Gothic horns or kingdoms. Note this feature. The papacy belongs to the second or the Christian stage of the Roman Empire, most often called the Holy Roman Empire as opposed to the pagan Roman Empire. Now, it was a horn among the Gothic horns. It was a revived head. The power of the Caesars lived again in the universal dominion of the popes. Did did you comprehend that? The popes simply replaced the Caesars, is what this author is telling us. The power of the Caesars in the old pagan Roman Empire, lived again or were reborn in the rise of the papacy. Okay, the papacy was small at its beginning, but grew uh, grew to great dominion. It exercised as wide a sway as the Caesars it had succeeded. All Europe submitted to the pope's rule. It claimed and still claims a power without rival or without limit. The papacy claims itself to be the vicar of Christ, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings. Hallam, the historian, as we've already remarked, says of the 13th century, the noonday of papal power, the height of papal power, quote, Rome inspired during this age all the terror of her ancient name. She was once more mistress of the world, and kings were her vassals. Okay, clearly, the popes in the heyday or the noonday of their power ruled over the kings of the earth. The kings of the earth were her vassals. They did Rome's bidding. They served the pope and not the people just as the governors of the world do today. Now he says, remember the proud title taken by the popes, rector orbis, ruler of the world. And this also, the papacy fulfills the prophecy. Observe secondly, that the extraordinary feature, both in Daniel and the apocalypse, the mouth of this power, both the horn in Daniel and the head in John, has a mouth, a mouth speaking great things. This feature is marvelously fulfilled in the papacy. What a mouth has that Latin ruler. What a talker. What a teacher. What a thunderer. How has he boasted himself 
and magnified himself and excommunicated and anathematized all who have resisted him. Has the world ever seen his equal in this respect? All the Gothic kings were his humble servants. He was by his own account and is the representative of Christ of God, ruler of the world, armed with all the powers of Christ in heaven, in earth, and in hell. He is infallible. His decrees are irreformable. A mouth indeed is his, a mouth speaking great things. Notice in the third place, his warring with the saints. In the Apocalypse, we read, quote, it was given to him to make war with the saints and to overcome them, unquote. I'll not do more here than remind you of the fact that terribly as the saints suffered under the Caesars of pagan Rome, they suffered far more terribly and far longer under papal Rome. Let the massacres of the Albigenses, the Waldenses, the Hussites, the Lollards, the massacres in Holland and in the, and in the Netherlands, the massacres of St. Bartholomew, the massacre in Ireland in 1641, the tortures of the Inquisition, the fires of the stake kindled over and over in every country in Europe. Let these speak and testify to the fulfillment of prophecy. Yes, the papacy has made war with the saints and overcome them and worn them out and would have totally crushed and annihilated them, but for the sustaining hand and reviving power of God. In its prolonged, cruel, and universal persecution of the saints, the papacy has fulfilled this solemn prophecy. Let me just tell you, if you haven't already figured it out, Rome fulfills all the prophecies of the man of sin, the little horn, the son of perdition, the biblical, historical, and prophetic antichrist of the scripture. Rome fulfills them all, and no one else even comes close. Henry Grattan again continues. He says, notice in the fourth place, the predicted duration of this persecuting power. Daniel mysteriously announces its duration as three and a half years. John as 42 months. They're one in the same period of time. The symbolical nature of the prophecy, as well as the vastness of the subject, forbid us to take these times literally. As the beast is symbolic and its various parts symbolic, so the period of its persecuting head is symbolic. You find this period mentioned seven times over in Daniel and Revelation and called uh, 1,260 days, 42 months, and even three and a half times. These are, as we've said, the same period of time. Calculate for yourself, and you will find it so. Now, both in the Law and the Prophets, that is the Old Testament, the Law and the Prophets, a day is used as a symbol for a year. Moses, Ezekiel, Daniel use it the same way. The 70 weeks of Daniel, or 490 days to Messiah, were fulfilled as 490 literal years, that is, They were fulfilled on the year-day scale, a year for a day, a day for a year. On this scale, the 42 months, or 1,260 days, are 1,260 literal years. Nobody disputes this. We ask then, has the papacy endured this period? An examination of the facts of history will show that it has. From the era of its rise in the 6th century, at the notable decree of the Emperor Justinian, constituting the Bishop of Rome head of all the churches in Christendom, began in A.D. 533, 
1260 years extended to 1793, the date of the tremendous papal overthrow of the French Revolution. Here we have a fact of great importance. Note it well. To this we add the further fact that from the analogous decree of the Emperor Focus, confirming the headship of the Pope over all of Christendom in the year 607 A.D., 1260 years extended to 1866-67. 1866-1867, somewhere in there, the initial date of the recent remarkable overthrow of papal governments which culminated in the loss of the Pope's temporal power in 1870 A.D. So the Pope lost his temporal power. He could no longer be regarded as the king of kings. He had his temporal power withdrawn from him. Now, in that year, the papacy assumed the highest exaltation to which it could aspire, that of infallibility and lost the temporal sovereignty, which it had held for more than a thousand years. Now, let me explain. 1870 marked the year of Vatican Council I. At the very time of this council, the papacy had lost control of the kings of the earth. There was nobody, no kingdom on the earth that perfectly obeyed the pope anymore. But even at its lowest period of time, during the time when the papacy had lost its temporal power, as king of kings, the papacy did something that was unthinkable. It gathered up together at the council of the first Vatican Council and did the unthinkable. It declared itself infallible. Okay? Just an, an incredible turn of events. At the very time when, the, when God, <clears throat> because of the Protestant Reformation, had liberated all the people of Europe, the papacy, losing all of its power as a result, <clears throat> had the audacity to declare itself infallible. It says, in that year, the papacy assumed the highest exaltation to which it could aspire, that of infallibility and lost the temporal sovereignty, which it had held for more than a thousand years. Thus, the predicted period has been fulfilled. What an evidence is this? The papacy has fulfilled the prophecy, not only in its geographical and historical position, its moral character, its political power, its blasphemous pretensions, its tyrannical career, but in its very chronology, in the point of its rise, the period of its duration, the era of its decline, the crisis of its overthrow. We've already directed your attention to the fact that the papacy is a complex power and requires complex symbols for its prefiguration. It is both a secular, that is, state, and an ecclesiastical or church power. It's a church and a state. The Vatican is a church and a state. It is both a secular and an ecclesiastical power, and the ecclesiastical power has arrogated to itself the right to create the secular or endow it with divine authority and has also wielded the energies of the secular power in pursuance of its own unholy ends. What, is, uh, what has uh, Henry Grattan Guinness just told us? <clears throat> the Vatican claims divine right to rule over the governments of the world and that the governments of the world must serve the papacy. It's the civil governments of the world by which the papacy imposes its divine right rule. The papacy cannot rule the world without the help of the governments of the world. And this is exactly why the Roman Catholic, uh, 
church is both a state and a church. And it expects the world to follow its image of a church-state union. You want to ever wonder what the image of the beast is? It's a global church-state union. The church makes the laws, the state enforces them. That's exactly what the old world order was, and it's exactly what the new world order is a global church-state union where the papacy is king of kings and lord of lords. He controls the priests, the pastors, and the education we get in the churches. He also controls the laws of the governments, and the governments impose his laws by force upon the people. Thus, even without a profession of Catholicism from any of us, we are made Catholic by force, by civil law. And again, I'll recommend, as I always do when this discussion comes up, a, a, a very, very informative video by Richard Bennett of BereanBeacon.org called Ro- Vatican Control Through Civil Law. Write that down. Vatican Control through civil law. Richard Bennett was a Roman Catholic priest, an Irish Roman Catholic priest for several decades. And as he was called to Rome, he was there at the time, he had been reading his Bible, and he was there in the Vatican at the time when an enclave, some uh, meeting of the bishops and the cardinals had dismissed. And there he was looking down upon this so-called St. Peter's Square and a sea of scarlet and purple unfolded before his eyes as all the ecclesiastics of the Roman Catholic Church came out of session to fill St. Peter's Square. And that's when God opened his eyes, the scarlet and the purple. He knew that he was a servant and a priest of the scarlet harlot of Rome, and he came out and forever since has been telling the truth about the Vatican and her control over the civil governments of the world. Please do take any opportunity that you have to watch that short video by Richard Bennett of BereanBeacon.org. Richard Bennett, and his video is Vatican Control Through Civil Law. He'll show us that even today, the governments of the world are controlled by the papacy. And the civil governments of the world rule as the papacy claimed. And the civil law, our own government. You wonder why the, 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 the Washington, D.C. is not responsive to the people of this country? Because they are bound by a divine right to serve the Pope. Okay? This is simply the old world order restored. He said again, we have already directed your attention to the fact that the papacy is a complex power and requires complex symbols for its prefiguration. It is both a secular, a state, and an ecclesiastical church power. And the ecclesiastical power, the church power, has arrogated to itself the divine right to create the secular or the state or to endow the state with divine authority and has also wielded the energies of the secular power in pursuance of its own unholy ends. And what are the unholy ends of the papal power? To make war against the saints, to deceive God's people, to create an earthly kingdom, a counterfeit kingdom as contradistinction with the heavenly kingdom of Jesus Christ. It's called the New World Order, and it's simply a mirror image of the Old World Order. Revelation chapter 13 represents both these ecclesia, uh, excuse me, both of these organizations as beasts. Okay? Revelation chapter 13 represents both these organizations, that is the church and the states, as beasts. The one is represented as a ten-horned and the other as a two-horned beast. The former rises as does each of the beasts of Daniel from the sea. 
The latter rises from the earth. The one springs up in storm, the other in stillness. Striving and warring winds attend the birth of the one, and the other grows up quietly from a low terrestrial origin, like an ivy plant or a noxious earthborn weed. The ten horns of the one are strong iron kingdoms. The two horns of the other are gentle and lamb-like. May I dare suggest that that's precisely how the American government rose up? For all intents and purposes, it looks lamb-like. It looks like a Christian nation, but it's not. It serves the beast, as is prophesied in the Scripture. The two horns of the other are gentle and lamb-like. The two beasts stand side by side. They act together in everything. The two beasts, the ten-horned and the two-horned beast, the sea beast and the wilderness beast, They act together in everything. Now, does any of us have the right to believe that the United States government represents its people? Not to be be consistent with the scripture and prophecy. We must understand that the government of the United States obeys the Pope. And if you understand that, then you can understand why there is no reconciliation between the body of Christ and either one of these beasts. Now, Henry Gratton Guinness continues. The earthborn beast, that is the second beast, is the prophet of the seahorn beast. And he is a false prophet. He compares compels subjection to the secular power, especially to its new head, that head which has been slain and healed. That is the first beast, the papacy. What we see today is our government making us all Catholic. That's why the governments with Mexico, that's why the, the, the borders between the United States and Mexico, Roman Catholic Mexico, Roman Roman Catholic South and Central America will never be closed by our government. They are Catholicizing the United States of America. All of these people flooding across the border are not to be recognized so much as Mexicans, but Roman Catholics. Mexicans, even though they are not devoutly religious, they obey the priests. And that's why Rome finds them so important in this country. That's why the governors of this world will not, that's why the governors of this country will not close that border. They'll make every pretense, but they will never do what it takes to stop the flood of Roman Catholics from flooding into this country. Backing up, he says, he, that is the Pope, compels subjection to the secular power, or rather the second beast, the government, we can say the government of the United States compels subjection to the secular power, especially to its new head, that head which has been slain and healed. He's talking about the papacy. Okay? He establishes an idolatrous worship of that head or a submission to its divine uh, to it as a divine authority he quote exercises unquote all the power of the ten horned beast in his warfare against the saints and the servants of god he works false miracles and accomplishes lying wonders and even brings down fire upon the earth in imitation of the prophets of the lord you ever hear of of the term shock and awe, when the government of the United States launched its initial attack against the government of Iraq, they called it shock and awe, and fire descended from heaven, did it not? In the sight of men on national and international television. That's a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. He says that is, he causes He causes judgments to descend on those who resist. 
Now, we know one thing about Saddam Hussein from the scriptures. He resisted this new world order. It was Donald Rumsfeld and the Reagan admin, and Ronald Reagan and all those who put him in power. And it was them who took him out. Why? Because he turned on them and decided not to be a part of this new world order. And the government of the United States may rain fire and brimstone on their heads. They appear to have the power of God Almighty. And if you were a member of any of these third world nations against which the United States government is waging war, you would think that they had the power of God Almighty to be able to do what they do, to take a drone, which is not even manned, to fly remotely across the border into Iraq from a control operator's position in Arizona someplace. And to fly that aircraft around the country, taking video pictures, infrared pictures, satellite pictures, every kind of picture, and then even launch hellfire missiles at anyone it chooses. You talk about simulating the power of God Almighty, the government of the United States does, and it causes hell to rain on anybody who resists this beast power. He says he uses the instrument of excommunication, a weapon of celestial authority, and wields it with terrible effect. He lays kingdoms under interdicts and nations under anathemas. That's the power of the Pope. He can control the governments of the world simply by threatening to put the nation under an interdict. That's the power of Rome. And he's used that power all throughout history. And he still uses it today. He lays kingdoms under interdicts and nations under anathemas. He makes idolatry compulsory, delivering to the secular arm anyone who refuses to render it that they may be put to death. This is prophecy, and it is, it is revealed perfectly to the letter in history. This is the history of the old world order. The Pope ruled over the kings of the earth. If a king did not obey, the Pope issued an anathema and an interdict, closed all the churches so the people couldn't get the sacraments, wouldn't give them Christian burials if they died. There were no weddings. Literally locked down, quote-unquote, heaven so that nobody could enter in, according to the Roman law, and commanded the people that they were no longer bound by any oath that they had to that king, that they are bound and duty-bound to overthrow that government. And if they fail to do that, the Pope would just simply issue a blanket excommunication to the whole nation, thus depriving them of any hope of salvation. No other power on the earth has this so-called power. No other power on earth comes close. This is strictly talking about the papacy and no one else. There's not even a close second candidate for this position. God does not deal treacherously with his people. He's made the Antichrist of the Bible so certain that no one but who but those who are self-deceived could deny it. Just as Christ wants us to know who he is, he wants us to know who his counterfeit is. The prophecies of the Bible predict exactly how this Antichrist power would operate, and history proves that it is none other, none, no, no other candidate but the papacy. He continues on the top of page 158 now. He says he prohibits all dealings with the so-called heretics, all traffic and communication with them. He allows none to buy from them and none to sell to them. He institutes a system which is now called boycotting, 
a system of persecution which was freely wielded by the popish priesthood in the Middle Ages and is still employed, as we know, in certain papal lands. And this papal land here in the United States practices this boycotting. The Roman Catholic lobby in Washington, D.C. can issue a boycott. It is it is, it is uh, uh, taken up by the priests and, and, uh, and preached to the pew sitters in the Roman Catholic Church, and Roman Catholics are absolutely forbidden to buy from certain heretical uh, organizations. Uh, on a larger scale, they call it economic sanction. That is, when popish nations decide to deprive another nation of the very necessities of life. That's the United States. It issues economic sanctions against those who will, cannot, will not cooperate with the Pope's new world order. Now, he continues... How could the mutual relations of the political and ecclesiastical powers in the apostate Roman Empire be better represented than by these wonderful symbols? Here are a monarchy and a priesthood in close nefarious association. The priesthood anoints the monarchy, serves it, and uses it. Together they rule, and together they persecute. No symbol can represent anything. No parable can correspond in all respects with the reality it depicts. It is surely enough if the principal features and primary relations are exhibited in the symbol or reflected by the parable. This is just what is done in the apocalyptic prophecy. Look at the facts. The papacy has been a political power for more than a thousand years. The popes of Rome have been secular monarchs. They have possessed territories. They have levied taxes. They have laid down laws. They have owned armies, and they have made wars. The papal monarchy has been for ages an integral part of the Roman Empire. The papacy has also been a sacerdotal power, and is still so. While its temporal government has fallen, its spiritual remains. Further, the papacy is served by an extensive sacerdotal organization, embracing about a thousand bishops and half a million of priests at the time of the writing of this book, I will add. This organization controls the convictions and the actions of 200 million people belonging to more than 30 nations. He's speaking about the pew-sitting, card-carrying Roman Catholics of the world. At that time, only 200 million. Today, it's far in excess of that. He says, if the best symbol to represent the Roman Empire with its rulers be a ten-horned beast, What better symbol to represent the papal hierarchy than a two-horned beast whose horns are like those of a lamb while it has a voice of a dragon? And what better name for that hierarchy could be found than the false prophet? Does it not pretend to utter the messages of heaven? And as Moses and Elijah called down the fire of God's judgments on the enemies of Israel, Has not this hierarchy brought down again and again in the estimation of millions the judgments of God on those who have resisted its will, whether individuals or nations? Has not this been one of its most tremendous and irresistible weapons? Read the history of the Middle Ages and of the 16th century. What nation in Europe has not been laid from time to time under papal interdicts and compelled by these means to submit to the decisions of the Roman pontiffs? And has not the priesthood, too, been the author and instigator of the wholesale system of idolatry and persecution? Has it not employed the power of the state in enforcing idolatry, 
and cruelly persecuted to death millions of the faithful who would not bow down the knee to the modern Baal. In all this history, only too faithfully corresponds to prophecy. Deep calls to deep, and the utterances of inspiration are caught up and echoed by the experience of generations. The voices of the prophets come back in thunder from the courses of ages, and the proof that God has spoken reverberates throughout the world. Having briefly considered John's prophecy concerning the rise and reign of the papal power, we have now to glance at his prediction of its fall and its overthrow. This you will find in Revelation chapter 17 through 19. We've not time to read these chapters now. You're doubtless familiar with them, and we will do well to study them carefully and thoroughly. They contain the second complex or duplicate prophecy concerning Romanism, the career and the judgment of, quote, Babylon the Great, unquote. In this prophecy, John beholds the ten-horned beast representing the Roman Empire bearing a mystical woman dressed in purple and scarlet, decked with gold and precious stones and pearls, a harlot and the mother of harlots and abominations, the guilty paramour of kings, the cruel persecutor of saints, intoxicated but not with wine, drunk with the blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus. What a vision. What a prophecy. You remember the angel's interpretation of this vision, quote, the woman which thou sawest is that great city which reigneth over the kings of the earth, unquote. That woman represents a city, and I'm here to tell you it is Vatican City because it is Vatican City and only Vatican City, not London. London is not part of this fourth and final Roman Empire. It is Vatican City which reigneth over the kings of the earth. That woman is Vatican City. It's a church, isn't it? He said, we showed that that city was Rome, indisputably Rome. That Babylon the Great means Rome is, in, is admitted by the Romanists themselves. Jesuit Cardinal Robert Bellarmine says that, quote, Rome is signified in the apocalypse by the name of Babylon, unquote. Cardinal Baronius admits that, quote, all persons confess that Rome is denoted by the name of Babylon in the Apocalypse of John, unquote. Boswet observes, the historian observes that, quote, the features are so marked that it is easy to decipher Rome under the figure of Babylon, unquote. But while admitting that Babylon the Great, seated on the seven hills, means Rome, Papal interpreters assert that it means heathen Rome and not Christian or papal Rome, the Rome of the Caesars and not that of the popes. In reply to this, we answer first that the name upon the harlot's brow is mystery and that heathen Rome was no mystery. The true character of heathen Rome was never concealed. On the other hand, Christian Rome, or rather Roman Catholic Rome, which is not Christianity at all, is a mystery. It is not what it seems. In profession, it is divine. In character, it is satanic. We say in the second place that there is a marked and intentional contrast in the apocalypse between the two cities, Babylon and Jerusalem which is overlooked by the papal interpretation, Babylon in the Apocalypse is a city and a harlot. Jerusalem in the same book is a city and a bride. The former is the corrupt associate of earthly kings, the latter the chaste bride of the heavenly king. But the latter is a church. The former, then, is no mere heathen metropolis 
The contrast is between church and church, the faithful church and the apostate church. In the third place, we point to the fact that the judgment described in Revelation chapter 18 falls on Babylon when her sins had reached unto heaven. That is, in the darkest part of her career. But when Alaric destroyed Rome in A.D. 410, that city had improved. It had become Christian. It was purified at that time from its pagan idolatries. Nor had it then sunk into the darkness of the papacy. It was not in the 5th century that Rome reached the utmost height of her iniquity. The capture of the city by the soldiers of Alaric, when it was neither pagan nor papal, could not have been the judgment here foretold. In the fourth place, we point to the fact that the destruction of Babylon foretold in the apocalypse is total and final. As a great millstone, quote-unquote, a millstone, she is plunged into the deep. There is no recovery. This cannot refer to the mere burning of Rome in A.D. 410, for that event was speedily followed by the complete restoration of the city. When the Babylon of Revelation chapter 18 falls, the smoke of its burning goes up forever. It is found no more at all. In the fifth place, we point to the fact that the foretold destruction of Babylon is accomplished by the horns or the governments which were previously subject to her rule. We freely admit that the Goths destroyed ancient Rome, but the Goths were not previously subject to Rome. The Gothic nations did not first submit to Rome obediently and then cast her off and rend and trample and destroy her. All this, however, these nations did in the case of papal Rome. For centuries, they were subject to her sway. Then they cast her off. Look at the French Revolution. See the deeds of France. Look at Italy in 1870. They declared their own independence. They threw away the Pope's power. They would no longer allow the Pope to be their king. They wanted their own king. They elected their own king, and they wrote their own laws, and the papacy had no authority over the secular government of Italy. See the continent today. In the sixth place, we point to the fact that the foretold destruction of Babylon is immediately to be followed by the marriage of the Lamb. This is clearly foretold in Revelation chapter 19, but the capture of Rome by Alaric was not followed by that event. Alaric captured Rome 15 centuries ago while the marriage of the Lamb is still yet future. This utterly excludes the notion that the destruction of Rome by Alaric is the judgment intended and that Babylon the Great represents pagan Rome. And as Babylon the Great does not represent Rome pagan, it must then, of necessity, represent Rome papal. There's no other alternative. You see, God doesn't leave us to guesswork. It's all there. All we have to do is find it and read it and then believe it. Now, in conclusion, read this wonderful prophecy concerning Babylon the Great in the clear and all-revealing light of history. I ask those of you who have, who have read the history of the last 18 centuries, did not Rome Christian become a harlot? Did not papal Rome ally herself with the kings of the earth? Did not glorify did it not glorify itself to be a queen and call itself the mistress of the world? Did it not ride upon the body of the beast or the fourth empire and govern its actions for centuries? Did not papal Rome array itself in purple and scarlet and deck itself in gold and precious stones and pearls? Is not this the very attire of the papacy today? We appeal to facts. Go to the churches and see for yourself. Look at the priests. Look at the cardinals. Look at the popes. Look at all the purple robes they wear. Look at all the scarlet robes they wear. See the encrusted jewels. Look at the luxurious palaces in which they live. 
Look at the 11,000 halls and chambers in the Vatican and the unbounded wealth and glory gathered there. Look at the gorgeous spectacles of St. Peter's at Rome, casting even the magnificence of royalty into the shade. Go and see these things for yourself or read the testimony of those who have seen them. Shamelessly, Rome wears the very raiment in the very hues and colors portrayed in the pages of inspired prophecy. You may know that the harlot, by her attire, as certainly as by the name upon her brow. But to come to the darkest feature, has not the Church of Rome drunk most abundantly the precious blood of the saints and the martyrs of Jesus? We appeal to the facts. What of the Albigensians of the 13th century? What of the multitudes of Waldenses from the valleys of the Alps? What about the time of Cromwell and the Commonwealth? You've surely not forgotten Milton's poet of poem about them, those memorable lines. And what are the persecutions of the Protestants in France, those dreadful persecutions, mercilessly continued for more than 300 years? What are the massacres of St. Bartholomew and the re- revocation of the Edict of Nantes? What of the fires of Smithfield? What of the terrible inquisitions that carried on uninterrupted by 83 consecutive popes over a period of 605 years? Can you even number the souls of those who were destroyed by the the scarlet harlot of Rome? Stay. I'll take you to the inquisition. You shall enter its gloomy portals. You shall walk through its dark passages. You shall stand in its infernal torture chamber. You shall hear the cries of some of its victims. You shall listen to their very words. What agonies have been suffered in these somber vaults, unseen by any human eyes save those of the fiendish inquisitors themselves. What cries have been uttered in this dismal place which never reached the open world in which we live? Locked doors shut them in. Stone walls stifled their cries. No sound escaped, not even that of a faint distant moan. But now and then a victim found release. One and another have come forth from the torture chamber, pale and trembling, maimed and mutilated to tell the things that they experienced when in the hands of the holy inquisitors of Rome. We shall call in some of these as witnesses. This book is Limborch's History of the Inquisition. It tells the story of its origin 700 years ago and of its establishment and progress in France, Spain, Italy, Portugal, Poland, Sicily, Sardinia, Germany, Holland, and other parts of the world. It describes its ministers and its methods, its vicars, assistants, notaries, judges, and other officials. It was a vast organization. It describes the power of the inquisitors and their manner of proceeding. It unveils their dreadful tribunals opens their blood-stained records, describes their dungeons and secret tortures they inflicted, the extreme, merciless, and unmitigated tortures, and also the public so-called acts of faith, the autos de fe, or the burning of heretics. What a record! What a world of tyranny and intolerable anguish compressed into that one word, the Inquisition. Tyranny over the conscience. Men in the name of Jesus Christ, stretching and straining, maiming and mangling their fellow men to compel them to call light darkness and darkness light, to call the gospel of Christ a lie and the lie of Satan true, to confess that wrong is right and acknowledge right is wrong to bow down to a man and worship him as God, to call the teachings of Christ heresy, 
and the teachings of Antichrist divine. Tremendous was the power of that dread tribunal. In Spain and Portugal, it completely crushed out the Protestant Reformation. No secrets could be withheld from the inquisitors. Hundreds of persons were often apprehended in one single day, and in consequence of information resulted from their examinations under torture, thousands more were apprehended. That's right. One of the jobs of the Inquisition was to torture someone enough to give up the names and locations of other true Bible-believing Christians. You talk about prophecy being fulfilled, this is it. They made war against the saints. It can't be anybody but Rome. There's no other candidate. The Bible tells it straight. All we have to have is courage enough to admit it. What history will not allow us to deny? What Bible prophecy will not allow us to deny? Christianity today has denied it and is now returning to the Roman Catholic Church. God help us. God in his mercy help us. We've concluded our hour. We'll stop at the top of page 168, and I'll take a short recess and get a cold drink, and we'll come back for an hour of discussion. I'll hand it over back over to you, Walt. My name's Tom Fress, host of Inquisition Update, heard Monday through Friday on FirstAmendmentRadio.com. I read books like this on Inquisition Update every day, trying to wake up God's people trying to wake up the Protestants to return to the protest. The protest is not over. Christ has not yet come. 